Hello and welcome to the show. This is Mid-American Gardener and we're going to answer some pressing, timely questions that are going to come from the audience, from the viewers. And I have some three really talented folks here. I'll, I'll even maybe include myself as a three and a half. <laughs> and we are going to answer your questions. Hi, I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois on the Urbana-Champaign campus. And so my topics would be perennials and cut flowers. However, I want to introduce you to the other three panelists and they will be answering your questions. So I'm going to throw it over to you, Chuck Voigt. Thank you, Diane. Uh, I'm Chuck Voigt. I recently retired from crop sciences at the University of Illinois. My specialties were vegetables and herbs. And still are. And still are. And uh, as you'll see in a minute, I can also do some fruit things, although it's more Bob's area. But uh, first of all, a couple of weeks ago, I was on the show. We were running out of time and I was answering a peach question, and I said you should cut back uh, the bearing wood uh, by a third to a half to try to get rid of some of the flower buds. I didn't explain what bearing wood is. Peaches bear, they only flower on last year's growth, so that, that last year's growth, which, you know, however much it is, if it's six inches, if it's eight inches, that, that, that's what you're doing a third or a half of, not the whole treetop, so I, I didn't want that to go wrong in people's minds. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I also had a pear question that time, and, and this is a pear question that I didn't get to that time. This is a pear, pear uh, question? Yes. It was uh, about a pear tree. Uh, they had what they thought was a miniature pear tree in their backyard in Park Ridge, Illinois. Uh, was on the property when they purchased it in 1961. Wow. So that's been a while. Uh, and about 2004, it really took off and started growing and they had bumper crop and not so much lately. Uh, and <clears throat> what I think might have happened, if in fact it was a dwarf pear tree, and somehow if, you, if the grade changed enough so that the, the, the cyan could root. Oh, the graft union. Huh? Yeah, if they've got mm -hmm. up over the graft union so that the top could root in, that's one possibility. The other possibility is, is if you've really changed your fertility program, like if there's grass underneath and you've, you have a lawn care company that's fertilizing the grass four mm -hmm. times a year or something, you really don't want to fertilize pear trees because if you, if you force them into uh, heavy growth, uh, they become more susceptible to fire blight, they don't set up as many flower buds and all those kinds of things. So. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking that's that's might be what's going on. Uh, they said the the leaves turned red this year, and usually they've been yellow. Mm. That's usually a sign that the tree has really had a good year and, and stored up some anthocyanins, anthocyanins in, a, in addition to some of the other pigments. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, they're worried that they're going to have to cut it down to keep it away from the power lines, and. Um, so be careful with that because like over fertilizing, over pruning on a pear tree can also stimulate growth. It mm -hmm. becomes very susceptible to things. So um, <coughs> it's, yeah, it's, I'd say reduce fertility, just don't, just don't fertilize it for sure. Yeah, don't fertilize it for sure. Uh, don't, don't tend to water it too much. Let it, let it be a little starved for water. You know, don't let it croak in a, in a drought, but mm -hmm. don't, don't be too kind to it. That sounds like good advice yeah. <laughs> and not that easy. difficult. So very good question. Thank you, Chuck. And now I am going to send this next question over to Candace Miller in Thanks. the middle. Thank you, Diane. Uh, my name is Candace Miller. I am a uh, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, and I serve um, six counties in the northwest corner of the state. And my specialty is kind of just home horticulture in general, but especially annuals and perennials, landscaping, cut flowers um, type of thing. So I have a question here about an orchid rose, um, otherwise known as a Malaysian orchid rose grape plant or Medanilla magnifica, a lot of names <laughs> for this plant. Uh, but their question is they've kept it alive for almost a year. <coughs> uh, the stems are brown and wrinkly, but they finally have some new um, leaves coming off, coming on. Um, the old leaves fell off, is this normal? Um, any tips basically that could help them um, kind of grow a better uh, orchid rose? Um, it's not normal for the, the leaves to fall off. It does sound like you have some type of issue going on. Um, they also mentioned that it's in regular potting soil. And the orchid rose is an epiphyte, just like uh, Phalaenopsis orchids, other orchids that you would have as a houseplant. 
naturally they grow in the canopy of trees in the in the rainforest so they do appreciate a more coarse uh, potting mix so I would probably switch it to an orchid um, potting mix repot it and put it in that you can get that at the store yeah, yeah any garden buy, center buy, buy yeah it's easy to easy to find because they really do prefer to dry out between their watering so I'm guessing what's probably happened is it's gotten a little too wet and mm -hmm. the stem started to rot and um, that's when your leaves started to, to dry up um, to fall off. So I would switch up the potting mix, let it dry a little bit, make sure it's getting a lot of light, a lot of humidity. Uh, they're kind of finicky uh, plants really, but they're beautiful, really great pink flowers on them. And they've mm. kept it a year. So. Yeah, so if you've done well this long, that's that's pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Candace. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to send it over to Dr. Bob Skirvin. Hello. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I'm Bob Skirvin. I, I, I teach horticulture in the University of Illinois. I'm actually retired, but I, I still do it. And so anyway, so my specialty is fruit crops and grapes and wine. And so what I want to talk about the, today is I, I always think it's a great idea to, to go look at the store and see what kind of stuff is there in season. Cause there's, and right now, strawberry season is doing, doing really well. The first strawberries, they had some real, real problems around the, uh, in California because they couldn't get any labor. They still got problems out there, but the, uh, m most of it is migrant labor coming to like Mexico, and then there's been this big problem you read about in the paper. It's a terrible problem that they don't want people coming in. All oh, the migrants are going to take over, and you know it's all this stuff they're fighting with, and they've had trouble uh, labor. So, so some of the first California strawberries are really pretty pinky. They weren't very good, and but they're, they're getting better now. I, I bought these today. Now when you get ready to pick strawberries, right right now they're huge strawberries. If you don't see that, they're really really gigantic strawberries. And uh, they call these the king, king blossom, king, king fruits is, is the way the way the flowers develop. They have a truss of flowers, and the one the flower that develops first one up here that develops is going to make the biggest flower. Yeah, I just almost did something bad there. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and <laughs> sorry. Anyway, and then the next one that develop here, they're smaller, but the first one, the, the king blossom, is is the very b biggest one. That's what these are right now, and that's the ones when you go out and pick your own. You know, it's always fun to get there early, get the great big strawberries. Mm -hmm. and, not the little ones, they're easier to clean and all. Anyway, they're in the store right now, and they're very, very nice. Now, the way I pick strawberries in the store is you take, pick up the box, and it's, it's called a clam pack, and the, it says a pound, and it's pretty close to a pound, and you smell the edges. Just take a smell it. If it doesn't smell good, don't buy it. Get the ones that smell the best, I, then, then when you get that down, then get the ones that are the reddest ones. I like the red ones better than the ones that have a little greeny in there. Uh, they're a little bit better yet, but, this, but smell them, and then when you eat it, you just eat them. And one of the things that, that I do, I can't get it all in my mouth at one time, <laughs> but I eat the cap. Diane wants to see if she's got the eating technique down. No, no, what I was going to say <laughs> was when he opened it, I could smell how good those strawberries smell yeah. from here. No, I'm not going to probably be eating those until after the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I do remember yeah. Bob always eats the cap, and if it's too... It, it, it's reputed yeah. that there's some anti-cancer yeah. activity that especially protect breasts and and uh, prostate hormone induced cancers and it's you know it's not hurt anything tastes like lettuce yeah eat it up <laughs> little salad <It's> <laughs> little salad well, and you eat it with the strawberry <laughs> right you, know, you yeah, eat it all together so. so well very good boy those are beautiful and they smell great we'll, well, we'll eat them later i'll eat mine now. <laughs> okay <laughs> well let's go to the special did you know segment the presence of mosquitoes can be reduced significantly by minimizing the amount of standing water around your home. Change the water in bird baths and chlorinate your swimming pools. Okay, it's a shame when we have to talk about it, but mosquito season will be upon us. Yeah, Let's the, the covers that you put on them early in the spring, if you don't get that off, sometimes collect water and can breed them true. before the season and, gets going. And that's not good. That's not so, good. so be aware of that. Well, let's go to the phone lines, and we're going to see what Bob's question is for us on line two, and it's a, it's about a tree. Hi there, Bob. Good evening. And uh, what is your question? My question is, it's concerned with the uh, ash tree, and I know that the ash borers are going around, but uh, uh, my tree's looking good, except I got one or two branches that look like they're dead, and uh, uh, I want to know if, if I should go ahead and trim it and burn the wood or what just to keep the getting worse in the future. Okay, so a dead branch on an ash tree. Mm -hmm. 
more than likely you probably do have uh, an emerald ash borer in fish station. I'm not sure where you're located, but in most areas of Illinois now we do have an established uh, EAB infestation. So you can certainly prune out those areas, and I would for safety because ash becomes very brittle once the, the limbs do start to die. But more than likely, the, um, the larva of the, the ash borer is already throughout probably the trunk that's below those branches. So pruning them out is not really going to slow it down much, unfortunately. Um, but I still would probably prune them out for safety. And then uh, depending on how much of your canopy has died, you could still do some treatments. But usually once, once you start to see canopy die back, it's really almost too late to do any type of insecticide treatments at that point. So I would consider thinking about taking the whole thing down and replacing with um, really another species at this point more than likely. Right. That's, I remember that on my yard, you really what you do, you're going to lose those trees. It's going to die. Yeah. It's going to be gone. <laughs> so what you want to do <laughs> is maybe right now, go, go buy you a nice nice tree, the nice six foot tree or some, some nice tree, the best best you can afford, and stick it in place, let it start growing. And then as, as you can afford to have the tree, people come cut your tree down and they come and do it. The other one will replace it. As, as it grows up so yeah and it oh and it is going to be best to burn <coughs> that wood at your site so don't mm -hmm. cut that cut that wood and then travel transport it anywhere because you could still spread the, the bore that way but you can certainly burn that wood on um, on your site okay well thank you very much bob for your question we're going to go to Rusley on line three and i hope i said your name right about a cactus question hi there line three yes Yes, what is your question? Yeah, uh, my name is Bill Kikado, and mm -hmm. my question is that I uh, bought a friend of mine a Christmas cactus. Okay. Uh, uh, one month ago, or uh, in January. Okay. And uh, his, uh, his plant gave him flowers, but mine did not. Uh, what's the problem? Although we have uh, similar atmosphere, I mean, the plants have the similar uh, my, uh, also, I have another question. Do I need to put it outside? It's okay to put it outside the, the, uh, the house in order to get okay. more... Okay. Uh, so Christmas cactus, why wasn't it flowering, mm -hmm. and can it go outside? And did I hear he got it a month ago? In January. In January. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Anybody? Right. Well, the, Either way. the Christmas cactus or the Thanksgiving cactus, uh, it blooms based on day length, and that typically would happen with a Thanksgiving cactus in November, Christmas cactus in December, mm -hmm. and so by January, the flowers are going to be gone, yeah. and so you're into the next cycle. Uh, as far as as far as taking it outside, yes, once once the weather gets settled, so it won't get frosted, uh, take it out, acclimate it to outdoor conditions. Don't put it into the blazing sun to start with. Mm -hmm. Put it in at least partial shade to kind of get it used to that. Probably never in the blazing sun. No. Um, and then, but that usually will, will they'll, they'll really appreciate that, really grow, store a lot of energy. And then as it starts to cool off in the, in the fall, they start to set up the flower buds. And then mm -hmm. depending mm -hmm. on whether it has points on the segments or rounded corners on the segment, It'll, if, it, if there are points, it'll start to flower in November. If it's rounded, it'll start to flower in December. Yeah. And, and, you can, and bring it in the house. Yeah, leave, yeah. It, leave it outside, and, and but obviously bring it in before the first frost comes. But it can but take yes. those cool nights yeah. as yeah. long as Down it's to not 40s. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's some, some, some chilling is, is good. Seems like it's mm -hmm. It seems to set it. up yeah. more mm -hmm. buds. Yeah. <laughs> so rounded December, December rounded, DR. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out. <clears throat> Pointed remember. Thanksgiving, and that one, yeah. I... Yeah. Well, and 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 point and pieces. Mar <coughs> Mar Mar marketing is such <laughs> that they call Thanksgiving cactuses Christmas names. So White Christmas and Kris Kringle and all those things are, in fact, Thanksgiving cactuses. Oh. But because they come in flower in November, you can sell them for a whole month. Okay. Where one that doesn't come out until Christmas is past. You know, oh, it's I hard see. to market a Christmas cactus in January. Yeah. Okay. To, to any great degree. So. All right. Well, now we have learned a lot here. <coughs> Amazingly enough, we have another Christmas cactus question. <laughs> so let's go to Nancy's question on line four. Hi, Nancy. Hi. My question is, my flower Christmas cactus did not bloom uh, this year. It bloomed prolifically last year. I, it, I was told last year to put it in a closet for the month of October and that it would bloom well that year, which it did. 
I did the same thing this year, but it did not bloom at all. Not one bloom. I have never heard Me of putting a Christmas cactus in the closet. No. Now that sounds amaryllis, yeah, but yeah. not so much Christmas. I'm surprised it, it must have been all set up and ready to go the first year. Yeah, I'm wondering if you already had buds form that first year that you did that so that once you took it back out of the closet it was ready to bloom because as Chuck just said in the last one, there's a short day plant. So as the days start to get shorter, that's what initiates your your buds. Yeah, so you remember well one, one time on this show they were talking about that you take the put to put the plant in like a back bedroom, someplace where it's a little bit cooler in the right. back yeah. bedroom to get it, get it some chilling. Oh, uh, that have might it. be yeah, what. I'll, I'll be, I'll be, you got confused and put it in the I closet. Bet that. Yeah. Not, not in the dark, but just in a cooler part right. of your house. And you want to keep it in a place where it gets natural light too. Like <coughs> don't put it in your kitchen, for example, where you're gonna have the lights on until 9 p.m. Because then you're you're throwing off that natural mm -hmm. day length cycle. So, so that could be it, maybe a back bedroom mm -hmm. or some place where you don't have the lights on and it's cooler. Okay, good. I'm glad we figured that out because I, I was confused a little bit about that. All right, now we have a question which I think we answered last week. But Linda, we're going to go to you on line six and I'll be ready to answer it if it's the same exact question. I, think I know it too. <laughs> and Chuck knows it too. Linda, are you there? Line six? Yes, yes, I am. And I know I heard you alluding to it last week and I just I thought I couldn't remember the details and I had family with me when we were out in okay. the street and I couldn't explain to them what those purple fields were. And they are beautiful unless they're your fields. <laughs> okay, so Chuck, do you want to? Well, it's hand bit. It's hand bit. Mm -hmm. um, and compared to some of the relatives in, in the mint family, it's, it's really kind of innocuous other than the fact that it's there, might attract cutworms or something, but it's pretty easy to kill. It's, it's a winter annual. Uh, it's not like Creeping Charlie or something. We get, those, we get questions sometimes mm -hmm. where those two are confused. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it, the thing I don't understand is why it gets started in one field and just turns it purple and then the next field won't be purple at all. And I don't know exactly why that is, but uh, it's just having the seed there, I think. Mm -hmm. Must be different practices of uh, either no-till yeah. versus, yeah, some, I don't know. Management. I don't know the agricultural part. We just know the, the horticultural right. weed. Right, and, and yes. when, when you have a cool spell or a rainy spell when they can't get into the fields, it really, it really, it really blooms quickly yeah. in the spring. And so... Uh, and the cool s couple of weeks we had was perfect for henbit, H-E-N-B-I-T, henbit. Right, they haven't been out there hitting it with cremoxone or right. something okay. else to think about. Okay, so it. Linda, we've now let everyone else know if anyone <laughs> missed, but it was beautiful. Enjoy the flowers in your life. Enjoy, they won't be around for long because the farmers will take care of that. All right, <coughs> let's go back to you, Chuck, with an email or whatever okay. you have there for us. Okay, I have an amaryllis question, which we, we seem to get a lot of those. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura says, I have an amaryllis from last Christmas, but it hasn't bloomed yet. And I don't, it, she doesn't explain what she means by last Christmas, but if she got it I around December and, and potted it up and started it, and then she has long leaves, no sign of a flower stalk, uh, what does she need to do to get it to bloom? Well, I think you're kind of out of luck for this, this cycle. Uh, the, the good thing is that if you treat amaryllis right, it's pretty easy to reflower them. Uh, if you have long leaves, you need to keep those as healthy and happy as possible. Uh, get them outside as soon as we get to settled weather, maybe by the middle, of, middle to the end of May. Uh, acclimate them to sunshine. Let them store up lots and lots of energy in that bulb. Keep it green through the whole summer if you can. And then when things start to get chilly again in the fall, uh, bring it in. Put the pot on its side so you remember not to water it. Good. And so let it dry up and, and die back. And then uh, next uh, Christmas or spring or whenever, uh, you know, for me, the, mine tends to take from five to six weeks from when I, I give them a start to when they bloom. So <clears throat> the problem with blooming them at Christmas is that then you have to keep the foliage happy from December to May, and that, that can be challenging but you, you don't ever want to cut it off while it's green because mm -hmm. that's, that's like saying we don't want you to bloom again. Mm -hmm. Any bulb really, yeah. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. 
Candace, you're next. Okay, I have a tree peony question here. They're asking, how do I stimulate my 12-year-old uh, purple tree peony to bloom next year? Uh, they moved to Illinois six years ago from Michigan, so I'm assuming they moved the tree peony along with them. Um, and the blossoms have petered out more and more each year. This year they had two buds with one white bloom. It has full sun. Um, the plant looks like it was grafted at the base, which it was. And the one white flower appeared on new uh, growth. I'm guessing what is happening here is that you probably didn't plant that um, tree peony quite deep enough. Um, typically with tree peonies, you want to plant that, uh, that graft union where your tree peony is grafted to your herbaceous peony about four to six inches uh, below the, the soil surface so that tree peony can start to get some roots um, established there. So it sounds like the, potentially that herbaceous peony is trying to take over from that um, tree peony is probably stealing energy away from that. So what I would do is try to prune out uh, that herbaceous growth that's coming from the, from the base. And you'll be able to tell the herbaceous peony from the tree peony. Um, if you're familiar with what an herbaceous peony looks like in your landscape, it's gonna have that same herbaceous foliage. It's gonna be unbranched and your tree peony is gonna be branched. So I would see if you can prune out some of that herbaceous growth and keep that from competing with your your tree peony and hopefully you'll get a little bit more energy going into that tree peony and get a couple more buds on it. Because they're That's beautiful. I, they are. They're very beautiful. It's worth is, working. Is it too late to raise the grade around the, the base of it, you, you know, think? I suppose you could try. You could do this a little bit every yeah, year. Yeah, a little, add like, a little extra, like, little extra like, soil every year. Yeah, just, just a little yeah. bit as you go. Yeah. So the roots don't. You don't shock it too much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. All right, Bob, you're up. I got another question here. And the question here is they have an established semi-dwarf Bartlett pear that bloomed a few years ago. And then it made two pears and then it hasn't bloomed since. What's wrong with my pear? <laughs> it doesn't say all that. <laughs> anyway, uh, pears are really funny and pears, in order to really start producing it first, you gotta make them flower. And one of the things that pears tend to grow straight up in the air. And if you've seen they kind of grow is a, a big oval and the apple trees are round but the, they're, they're big oval, and this big oval, they flower there, and they tend, but the, the first flowering that you get on a tree are the branches that are kind of growing out this way. And so what you gotta do, you gotta t help this poor old plant get started on it, ma making, making flower buds. And so what you need to do is start in encouraging some of the lower branches to kind of bend over this way. Now, it, out at the farm, we had a lot of pear trees out at the farm, and the ones that, the, the branches that flowered first were the ones that got heavy and kind of flopped over and laid on the side. They were the ones that flowered best. And what we did is we, you can use spreaders. You can, you can buy, you can make, make a big piece of wire, a piece of wood or something. You can stick it in the crotch of the tree, kind of here to here to here, and just force that branch to stay down here where it wants to grow up like this. It's going to stay down like this. And this, you can actually take a strings rope and take and tie it down mm -hmm. at the base mm -hmm. and, and put some branches, uh, spread out the branches, and those branches will develop flowers. And it's, it's too late. This right now, you want to do this, but for your talking about next year's season, and some of those produce flowers. But you got to get some of those branches down. And then once the pear tree kind of goes into a reproductive mode, then the, the, a lot of the rest of the tree will do that too. But you got to help it to get started. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. That's interesting. <coughs> Let's go to uh, Patsy's question. She's on line five and she has a planting question. Hi, Patsy. Hi. What's your question? Hi. I have um, a, a really dead zone under two trees. One is a long needled pine. The other is a short needled, maybe cedar. And it just seems to be um, a place where I can't get anything to grow. So there's been some construction. The soil's really bad. I've worked it up, but I, what I want to know is um, what can grow under these, this pine and possibly cedar tree, and what kind of amendments do I need to put in that soil to help something grow? I used to give a couple examples in my perennials class I'm of what grows <laughs> under evergreens. <laughs> I can remember what you were And that was a gazing ball, <laughs> a park bench, a an astroturf, and mulch. mulch. <laughs> it's very difficult. Does anyone? Well, how, how low is the branching? Yeah, it depends on the limbs. How low is your branching? Oh, they're we've high trees. They're high trees? Yes. Okay. Oh. Hmm. Well, so that might help. Some, so you're getting some light in from if the side. If you grow anything, you're going to have to start from the drip line and try to get it to grow in. Do you have it mulched at all? Yes. 
Okay, that's a good start. Mm -hmm. But it's gonna have to be something that likes it. Some shade tolerant ground cover, maybe the. And it, to you know, I think of English ivy, whether mm -hmm. you want that or not, I don't yeah. know. Pachysandra comes to mind, will, yes. will tolerate some acid, which pine needles tend to yes. generate. Possibly True. periwinkle. Possibly, yeah. that, that tends to it likes th it little not little thicken up the way I would like when it's, yeah. when it's overshaded. Possibly but, but a what combination. You're talking about, the drip line, you put, to put the baby's little plants out here, yeah. as they start going this way, some of them will start going this way, right. and, mm -hmm. and over a long period of time, then they'll kind of invade that space that they normally wouldn't want to go, but they will. And right. you can mm -hmm. encourage a half of them to go that way, and yeah. the others, Train but them a yes, you will want to keep mulching. Uh, and if you can work in a little other organic matters, mm -hmm. compost would yeah. be good. Mm -hmm. But that never hurts. small amounts, like we were talking with the peony, don't don't do any volcano big no. <laughs> no, just mountings. That would be not yeah, so good. Compost is too valuable to put on a volcano. But. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. <coughs> well, I think we are. Can we do another question? Okay, we're not going to do another question. <laughs> I wanted to do another question. <laughs> well, okay, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.